When Field Marshal Douglas Haig died in 1928, many thousands came out to mourn the death of the great hero of World War I. Yet today, the overwhelming view of the general is one of a mass murderer, a donkey who led millions of lions to their pointless deaths in the trenches for mere feet of land. However, to some modern historians, nothing could be further from the truth. So is Haig the butcher of the Somme or the great victor of World War I? To find out, I spoke to the military historian Nick Lloyd, whose works on the First World War have received wide acclaim. I will act as the devil's advocate, highlighting the accusations made against Haig, whilst also exploring his life story. Can you describe his, his early life and his background? Well, Douglas Haig comes from a whiskey distilling family, and it's sort of, you know, it's quite a rich family. So he comes from quite a, a well-to-do family that obviously have, you know, great interests in Scotland, land and so on. And so Haig, you know, is born into that set in the sort of, you know, late Victorian period. And of course then, you know, shows an interest in horses and the cavalry and polo. Um, and then goes to Brasenose College, Oxford, before he goes on to Sandhurst. Another interesting thing about his early life is his time in the empire. So as you say, he joins Sandhurst, he joins the army, goes to Sudan, to India, uh, to South Africa during the Boer War. How does this sort of form his views of empire, of duty and of Britain? Well, I mean, he becomes, you know, one of the most highly regarded officers in the British army, an, an officer that's seen to be quite diligent, quite educated, quite interested in his profession in a way that many of his other sort of contemporaries aren't necessarily. And he's interested in cavalry doctrine. He's interested in the nature of war, in reforming the army. So his service becomes, I mean, he's not the most decorated soldier. He's not the most sort of dashing cavalier officer that you find in the empire period. He has a close relationship with Sir John French, who is his boss in South Africa, who is more of a dashing figure. Um, but Hay becomes seen to be known as a good chief of staff, a good staff officer, a man who is very diligent, who is a thinker. And so he, his reputation is more of a sort of cerebral one than as a, a dashing man of action. But he sees the empire. He sees some of the problems of the empire. He sees the kind of war that they fight in South Africa, the nature of the enemy. So there's, that whole experience means that essentially by the turn of the century, post uh, the conflict in South Africa, Haig is setting himself up to be one of the coming men. And what was his view of warfare at this time? Obviously World War I is a hugely different conflict to these previous conflicts that Haig is involved with, particularly the Boer War, you know, that's a very sort of guerrilla campaign. How did he view warfare? How did he view war? And can you also talk about his sort of cavalry experience because this is relevant later on? Yeah, I mean he becomes, you know, clearly he believes that there is a role for cavalry in modern warfare. Now, that role might not necessarily be in the kind of traditional role, charging the enemy, but certainly in terms of a lighter or a scouting, a reconnaissance role, Haig is very keen on this because he sees cavalry as being, you know, essentially that arm of mobility and exploitation. So in the sense that Haig is more of a, always a traditional thinker in that sense. He understands war as enfolding in several set stages. There's going to be a sort of a main sort of battle for manoeuvre and then you'll have the decisive battle and then you'll have the exploitation and the retreat. And so Haig very much sees war in what you might call a traditional way. But of course he has experience of quite an untraditional war in South Africa. So he, I think he appreciates that times are changing and that the army is going to need to be reformed post-South Africa. It's going to need a different kind of soldier, a more educated soldier, a soldier that is able to act quickly on his own initiative. So he's not necessarily wanting a sort of automaton and a, and a, a sort of unthinkingly obedient soldier, but a soldier who is going to be able to take advantage of fleeting moments of opportunity. So I think Haig is, you know, part of that new generation of officers who have experience in South Africa and who are keen to reform the army in a way that is more modern and methodical and um, more reflective, I think, of some of the changes you see in the other armies in Europe before the First World War. So World War I starts, 1914. What does Haig do? What's he put in command of? Well, Haig takes the First Corps to war in 1914, and there are two corps forms, so there's, there's First Corps and the Second Corps. The other corps is commanded by General Sir Horace Smith Dorian. 
and they're under Sir John French, who's the commander in chief of the expeditionary force. And, you know, Haig takes First Corps all the way through the 1914 campaign, sees action at um, a number of places, particularly First Ypres, which is a really terrible battle in October and November 1914. And again, comes out of that with his reputation enhanced as a man who does not panic. He's a man who gets things done, fights well defensively, gets on with the French, and is a man that is rising to the challenge of war. So I think there's a, you know, the, and I think it's always worth bearing in mind the size of the British expeditionary force here. This is, a, this is an expeditionary force of about 100,000, 120,000 men. You know, the German army at this point is five, five or six. You know, it, it's, it's enormous. The French army have five full armies. We have two corps. The German army have seven full armies on the Western Front. So the British army are very, very small. But the role that it plays in 1914 is quite important because they play a key role in stemming the German you know, movement through France, Belgium and France that's known as the Schlieffen Plan. So the BEF, when Haig takes over, is, has sort of hugely expanded from, as you say, about 100,000 men to one and a half million. So this is a massive expansion in a, hu in a tiny period of time. And this is a completely unprecedented level of warfare. The British Army has never been as big as it was then, before or since. So does Haig go into his role in 1915 as the commander of this force with an outdated mindset? This is one of the accusations made against him. He's a cavalry man. He's fought around the empire in these much smaller scale wars, these guerrilla campaigns and he's simply outdated and a sort of bit of a technophobe in a way. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of criticisms of Haig, and I think it's always important to understand the historical context. He comes into a position where, as you say, the army is expanding enormously, um, almost tenfold within 18 months. It's completely unprecedented, and it's flooded with people who don't really know the job of soldiering. The British Expeditionary Force, you know, has lost so many people in the 1914 campaign, all experienced, a lot of officers have been killed. So it's largely been de-skilled, if you will. It's a big army, but Haig writes in his diary, he says, I, I don't have, a, have an army, I have a collection of divisions untrained for the field. So I have lots of divisions that don't know what they're doing. And I think that's absolutely fair. And his job is to keep that army together, train them up, make sure that they become trained for the field and then bring about the decisive battle that year. So it's an enormous task. The argument about technophobic Haig is quite an interesting one because Haig is actually very pro-technology. It's one of the great myths about him. Indeed, you could argue in, with certain technologies, he's far too um, enthusiastic. Um, for example, the use of poison gas. Poison gas is what one officer called a boomerang ally. It's unreliable. It's dangerous. It might not be that effective. It has to be delivered at the right place at the right time in the right concentrations to have the effect that you want. Um, and certainly in Luz in September 1915, Haig is, when he gets to use gas for the first time, he's absolutely overwhelmed with it. He's really keen on it. So the argument, certainly with gas, is Haig is actually very, very forward thinking. He's also forward thinking with things like air power. He's very keen on air power. He doesn't understand it, but he gets the right people in, such as Hugh Trenchard, who is the commander of the Royal Flying Corps, and gives him all the support he needs to push through bureaucratic hurdles to get the amount of air power they need. And, you know, he oversees a vast expansion in artillery, in infantry firepower. He's very keen on the tank. One of the criticisms of Hagee uses tanks too early. Um, so I think the idea of a technophobic Haig rests generally on one or two comments he makes pre-war about machine guns, um, saying something like, to the effect of, you know, machine guns you know, aren't that important or they're not that useful in war. Um, but if you look at what he actually does in the war, it's, it's a completely different story. And I think, you know, that that is really one of the myths about Haig. Haig is a very forward-thinking commander. Um, whether he uses the technology correctly, I think, is a slightly different argument, but he's not blinkered and he's very interested in the latest pieces of kit, and he always is through the entire war. Let's talk about the first day of the Somme, the worst day in the British Army's history in terms of casualties, 60,000 casualties. And Haig writes in his diary the next day, 
about the first day of the Somme, this sort of infamous date. Uh, so this is, he's writing on the 2nd of July and he says, A day of ups and downs. The adjutant general reported today that the total casualties are estimated over 40,000 to date. This cannot be considered severe in the view of the numbers engaged and the length of the front attacked. So the accusation obviously against Haig is that he doesn't care about the men's lives and that he is the butcher of the Somme. Yeah, I mean, I think Haig has a point. You have a, the Battle of the Somme takes place on a 20 mile front. So it's an enormous battle on a scale that the Brit British have never fought before. And of course, casualty statistics can be very difficult to, they didn't get full casualty statistics through until some time later. And there was an assumption a lot of those casualties were walking wounded or, or relatively minor injuries. And so I think Haig is putting a brave face on it. I think he's recognizing that this is gonna be, you know, the difficult phase is this is gonna be, understandably, we're gonna lose people trying to break into these defenses. Um, and so I don't think it's necessarily callous. I think it's a way of trying to steal himself for the next phase and say, okay, this is not too bad, we can carry on. And I think, you know, to be brutally honest, if you were to focus solely on those losses, there's no way you could continue operating in, in the way that Haig has to. He has a duty to, to bring that army to bear on the enemy and to defeat it, and he understands that's going to be costly. I think maybe the argument is that there was, that maybe there was a way to do it in a less costly way, but that, that's a sort of, that's a separate issue. I think Haig is focused on the business at hand. There is a contemporary view of the Somme as a completely pointless battle. 400,000 British died, you know, equal number of Germans uh, and a couple of hundred thousand French. Um, these statistics are, are sort of c c debated, I, I know, but you know, it's a lot of men. And for relatively little gain, you know, the British didn't advance particularly far. Uh, what do you say to this idea that the Somme was completely pointless, these men died utterly pointlessly and that Haig was, was, was using their lives to sort of test a theory that, that as you said, in, in previous battles had completely failed, this, this breakthrough theory. The Somme remains in some ways at the heart of perceptions of the First World War, certainly in Britain. Uh, it's a battle that we always return to, the seemingly futile opening, the, the men getting out of the trenches at 7.30 a.m. on the 1st of July and being shot down in droves, and the sense that this continues until the end of the battle in November of 1916. Um, I think if you look at the Somme and the way it changes and the different tactics that are used, and you, you can see the British, of course, use tanks, they use much more artillery as the battle goes on, um, different tactics, um, and so you do see a very different army by the end of the Somme. It's a blooded army, it's much more experienced, and it has a much better chance of really hurting the German army. I think the, the point about, you know, in the grand strategic situation of the war, is the Somme a victory? Is it a bloody victory, as some historians have called it? I think it's always going to be difficult to make that call. I think for the German army, they had held their lines or held most of their lines. Um, but the experience of the Somme was horrific. It was absolutely awful for the German army. And the sense of the German army that they were just being ground down. They were unable to move about a lot. They were in this awful trench warfare deadlock. They had lost control of the air to the Allies that had fighters and bombers and, and reconnaissance aircraft droning overhead almost continually. These sort of bombardments which come regularly and the Germans are astounded actually at the British, the amount of stuff they can bring to the battlefield. They think the British are inexperienced and they always regard them in a slightly lesser sense than they do the French. They have more respect for the French army in terms of its skill in, on the battlefield. Um, but they're amazed at the amount of stuff the British can bring, the shells they can bring, the, the aircraft, the tanks. And so they call it the material schlack, the material battle. And they, there's a sense in the German army that they're just being ground down. This is increasingly unfair. They're not able to strike back. So the German army do not want a repeat of the Somme. Whatever the British experience might be, they do not want a, a repeat of it. And so. In the spring of 1917, they move out of a lot of these positions because they move to the Hindenburg Line, which is a specially uh, prepared defensive line, because they don't want to be on the Somme anymore. So was the Somme a victory? Was it a defeat? I think it's somewhere in the middle. Initially, the British suffer very badly, but their army is not broken. It continues and it improves. And General Ludendorff calls the Somme the, the muddy grave of the German field army. Um, and... <laughs> 
that sense that something had died within the German army, something had snapped, is very strong because very quickly after it, German high command say, we cannot afford a second Somme. Can't do it. Even if the British suffer, we can't go through that again. And so that certainly feeds into German strategy as you go forward into the war. The Somme isn't the final offensive of the British army. Next year, in 1917, the, the famous Battle of Passchendaele uh, is another one of Haig's brilliant offensive ideas that, that, he, that he comes up with and, and, and pushes for. Do you think he, he's learned the lessons of the Somme by the time we get to Passchendaele? Passchendaele, or, or Third Ypres, is central to Haig's reputation. And it's, in some ways it's a reputation that can never get over Passchendaele. It's a battle that, alongside the 1st of July 1916, um, with the, the situation you have in 1917, these are the two images we have of the Great War. Troops getting out of the trenches on the 1st of July, beautiful summer morning, and Passchendaele, those mud-filled craters. Um, so they're the two images we have. And so Haig's reputation rests on the Somme and Passchendaele. Haig still believes in breakthrough. He still believes that they can go far. They can go far. And he believes the army is stronger now. It's better. It's got more artillery. You've got better tanks, um, better tactics of, of all kinds of things have improved. Um, but Haig is increasingly a lone voice for these grand manoeuvres, and he has lots of very difficult conversations with David Lord George, the Prime Minister, about how far they can go. Um, David Lord George, in his war memoirs, talks about this, where Haig comes and has a map out there and says, we can move through, you know, we can break the line and we can, we can take uh, the junction at Roulaire. And Lord George writes that Haig's thumb brushed the German border, as if the sort of, you know, Haig is... is you know, trying to go very far. And Lloyd George doesn't think this is possible. And he asks Haig, well, given the fact that you only advanced, you know, a handful of miles on the Somme, what guarantee is you're actually going to do this? Um, and Haig believes that the Germans are going to break. And, and so you do see a kind of, Haig still believes in breakthrough and in manoeuvre. And, you know, puts General Sir Hubert Goff in command of the operation at Third Ypres. And Goff is much more in Haig's mould, optimistic, aggressive, wants to break through. I think this is difficult, I think, to justify from a Haig perspective because by this point, this kind of grand breakthrough had really failed. It had failed in the French army, and I think growing numbers of senior officers are saying, certainly at this point in the war, we need to be far more cautious with what we do. The Americans are in now, so maybe we need to adopt a more strategic defensive position on the Western Front until the Americans can intervene in strength. Or if we are going to fight, we fight in a way that makes the most of our advantages in firepower and things like that. And so it's quite telling that Haig promises a breakthrough. When that doesn't happen, he is in a very vulnerable position and then has to get General Sir Herbert Plumer in to restart the offensive. And Plumer is much more along those bite and hold lines. He's a, he's a general that's very good at limited offensives. And that's what they do at 30. So it's a battle of two halves. But ultimately, Haig's reputation still hinges on those two battles and hinges on Passchendaele. This is quite a difficult one to justify because so many, including those in London and his senior officers, were sceptical that a breakthrough could be achieved or should be attempted. The, one of the accusations against Haig is that he thinks he's on a sort of divine mission from God to win this war. And the accusation is that he is being, uh, you know, in a way callous with, with people's lives because of this mission, that he thinks that it's his, it's his, it's his position to, 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 uh, to win this war and that sort of anything goes in that sense. Do you think that there's any, any, uh, any truth in the fact that he may have been a sort of religious fanatic in this war? No, I don't think there's any truth in that. I do think that Haig's religious interest and faith become stronger as the war goes on. And I think it would be surprising if it did not, given the importance of the position he occupies and the enormous stakes in which he's, he's trying to grapple with. So I think he becomes much more focused on his own personal journey of faith. But also, he has been put in a position of enormous authority. And you need to have that sense of self-confidence that you are doing the right thing, otherwise you couldn't do it. So I think he, he leans on that in a way that I think most people would. Not because he's, he's using this in some sort of divine mission so much, but in a sense he needs the strength of the religious convictions to get him through and to keep him 
you know, busy and to keep him focused on what needs to be done rather than focusing on himself or the, the kind of problems the army has. He, he visits the wounded and he's aware, he's very aware of the casualty. You know, he, he writes in his diary quite often the casualty figures. He, he understands this. But it never really affects his motivation or his desire or his belief that in the end what he is doing is right. Um, he believes that this is a necessary price to pay um, and that it has to be paid if they're going to win. He writes in 1914, we cannot hope to win until we've defeated the German army and he knows this is going to be very, very hard. So his ultimate motivations don't change. Now we could argue that maybe they should or whatever, but Haig is in that position and he will do his best and he will do what he needs to do with his army. So in April 1918, Haig sends out a message to his troops, which has now become very controversial. I'm going to read it out. So he says, Every position must be held to the last man. There must be no retirement. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight on to the end. Does this show a sort of arrogance that Haig has, that he's this, this donkey, in the headquarters telling all his men go and fight to the last man go and uh, sh shove yourself into the enemy's gunfire and bullets whilst i sort of sit back and relax at hq yeah i mean what what you have in 1918 is you have the massive german spring offensive so russia has gone out of the war and germany decides to gamble everything on this massive spring offensive and they, they decide to focus on the british they're going to smash through the somme uh, they cause a collapse of fifth army in, in march 1918 um, and then the attack uh, across the Leith in, in April, which causes huge problems for the British. They're under massive pressure. And Haig, it's one of those few occasions, late March, early April 1918, where Haig wobbles. And he begins to not necessarily panic, but he's very concerned about the army because they're under enormous pressure um, from the German offensive. And he's worried that they're going to break. And so this is one of those rare occasions where Haig actually decides to if you like, wear the mantle of a more charismatic commander and actually, uh, you know, order of the day to his men. It's very rare that he would do this. So I think it indicates not so much Haig's arrogance, but his understanding of the seriousness of the situation. That this is it. The Germans are playing their last card. We have to resist. We have to hold on. Whatever. We must hold the line. And I think that's perfectly understandable. They have to in 1918. They have to hold the line. Um, and so I think you know, how well this is received, I think, is somewhat mixed. I think this is a joke that goes around the army that says, you know, OK, where's the wall? You know, back to the wall, where's the wall? Um, there isn't a wall. Um, but generally, the British Army, I think, accept that they've got to hold the line. They've got to play for time until the Americans can intervene in strength. And so I think that that order of the day is really an indication of just how serious it is in 1918 and how Haig recognises that now is a moment they just have to hold on. You mentioned earlier his relationship with, with, with David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, was uh, poor. Uh, you know, they didn't like each other. Was part of this because of Haig's personality? Was it because they had conflicting interests in terms of where they thought the priority of the war should be? Haig thought it should be in the Western Front. Lloyd George famously was more on the Eastern Front. That's where he thought the, the breakthrough would come through. Why was their relationship so bad? I think there's a clash of personalities. Haig is not particularly charismatic. He is... Um, he's not a particularly brilliant communicator, so he's not very eloquent with words. And so Lloyd George is much more um, flamboyant in that sense. And so they, they don't really see eye to eye. And of course, as you say, there are significant strategic differences. Haig believes the war can only be won on the Western Front. David Lloyd George just doesn't want to do that. He wants the British Army to be anywhere else almost. He wants them to be in Italy or uh, maybe the Middle East against the Turks. But Lloyd George struggles really with the military advice he's getting, which is not what he wants, but he can't really do without it. Um, and of course, later on in the war, he very much turns against Haig in a much more vitriolic sense. Uh, you see that in the war memoirs very, very clearly. Um, I think he recognises Haig's strengths, but I think from early on, Lloyd George is just looking at the casualty statistics and the lack of ground, and he's, he's thinking actually Haig... Haig is a big problem here. Haig is not understanding what they can do. Um, he goes to the French. He speaks to senior French officers and asks them somewhat indelicately what they think of Haig and whether they, they think he's any good and whether they might like to see a replacement. And The problem, Haig, a problem David or George has is no obvious candidate to replace Haig. There are several strong uh, generals on the Western Front, um, but there's no one that's really a shoe-in. There's no one that is really... 
or he feels able he can actually promote into that position. So he is, he, he's in a difficult position. So let's talk about the end of the war. When I was researching Haig, obviously hugely controversial figure, many, many people dislike him, hate him for all the reasons that we've talked about. But there was this really fascinating description of him from the National Army Museum on their website. And I'm going to read it. So it's this paragraph. He says, or they say rather, Field Marshal Douglas Haig is introduced as, uh, as having commanded the British Army when it achieved arguably its greatest victories, those over the Germans on the Western Front during the First World War. Under Haig, the British Empire engaged the main enemy in the main theatre of war and defeated it. Now, to me, that sounds like he's a great hero of World War I who defeated Germany. Do you think he won that war? Well, 1918 is Haig's justification. It's, it's the year where everything comes together. And so uh, if Haig's reputation has sort of latterly been focused on the Somme and Passchendaele on those difficult trench warfare battles, those people who've defended Haig always point to 1918. This is when it really matters. So I think, what is Haig's role in 1918? He is, he's in a slightly weaker position than he has been. There are more vocal critics of him. But he is in position and he, he survives the war. Um, what does he do in 1918? Well, he manages that coalition with the French. He is instrumental in the decision to appoint Foch as a, as a sort of overarching commander. And he is able to keep his armies together through the terrible spring offensive. And then he is able to go onto the front foot and be quite aggressive and say, look, we need to counter the Germans. We need to push forward. And of course, Haig masterminds this period of fighting that we call the Hundred Days between August and November 1918, where the British army really take the main offensive effort of the Allied coalition. The French by this point are really struggling. They're really um, not able to do that much offensively. Uh, the Americans take an increasingly important role, but it's still quite limited and they're still quite inexperienced. So the main, if you like, the main hammering of the German army is undertaken by the British Expeditionary Force and it's Haig's army. And it's, a, it's quite a different army to how it was in 1914 or even in 1916. But the victory of the Hundred Days is quite remarkable. They break the German line at Amiens and there's much more of a restoration of manoeuvre that we, we would have hoped to have seen earlier in the war. And Haig then coordinates a four-step offensive where they, they break the Hindenburg line in late September. And this is that really strong defensive position. And Haig attacks it and breaks it. And from that moment on, German defeat, German retreat is inevitable. So I think if we are going to criticise Haig for his maybe stubbornness or maybe um, tactical ineptitude at times earlier in the war, I think you have to look at 1918. What I would say, though, I think Haig improves when he has less to do. So what I mean by that is in 1918, Haig has army commanders, corps commanders and divisional commanders that are much more experienced. They know what they're doing. They know how to coordinate artillery, air power, tanks. They know how to attack positions. They know how to keep morale up. Haig can concentrate on the broader strategic issues of maintaining the coalition, moving reserves around and making sure this fits in with broader strategy with the French and with the Americans. And Haig is good at that. Where Haig struggles is where he is having to play quite a technical role for example, in 1916 with Rawlinson, where he's talking with Rawlinson about the bombardment and the length of the bombardment and the length of front, quite technical, low-down issues, which Haig is not so good at. When he has people that know what they're doing at that level, Haig, oh, Haig is better. So I think the argument about Haig is he is the victor of 1918, but of course he, in some ways, that was a good thing because his army had changed, so he didn't need to be quite as was, you know, that long screwdriver down all the way. He didn't need to do that in 1918. His army was better, more experienced. And so After World War I, Haig helps to set up the British Legion. He raises funds for ve uh, veterans and ex-servicemen. Uh, he spends much of his life dedicated to try and help those men who come back to Britain and in many ways are abandoned by, by the government and by the people. So does that show Haig is either feels guilty about all those men who died under his command, or does it show a sort of passion and respect for his troops that he's always had in, throughout his life? Yeah, I know. I think it's definitely the latter. I think it's a sense of duty. He feels he has a duty to those men who served under him to, to make sure they're looked after, or their widows or families are looked after in a way that perhaps they, they weren't. So I think it shows a sort of stern sense of duty that, that's, 
that's very much within Haig all his, his entire life. Um, those people, maybe unkind, would say that he has a guilty conscience. I don't think there's a lot of evidence for that. I think Haig, Haig always sleeps soundly. Now, we might find that incredible, but Haig always does, and that's somewhat why well, it may be difficult to understand his character. He's a Victorian. He has that stern sense of duty, which we might find difficult to understand today, but that's Haig, and that is what carries him through. And that is at once his greatest strength, but also perhaps one of his greatest weaknesses as a commander, as, a, as an officer. Overall, against all these accusations that I've said against Haig, that he was callous, that he was a religious fanatic, that he was stubborn, all of these, that he was the butcher of the Somme, the, you know, the major accusation against him. What's your overall defence of Haig, if you have one? I think Haig, you know, takes charge of the British Army during its biggest battles it will ever fight. He oversees the greatest, one of the greatest defeats we've ever suffered, the 1st of July 1916. And he oversees the greatest series of victories the British Army has ever won against the main body of the main enemy. And so that is why Haig's reputation is so vital to understanding the First World War, uh, the development of the British Army before and after. He is that pivotal person. And I think he is not as charismatic as maybe we would like. He is a rigid, ramrod-like self that he has, which means that for modern eyes, at least, he can be quite a difficult character to gauge. He's not particularly emotional. He doesn't see why he should be emotional. Um, but he is able, I think, to oversee that army, oversee the transformation of the army, make sure it continues to grow, continues to be fed, to be watered, to be equipped, to maintain the focus on the Western Front, to maintain the alliance with the French. I think there are enduring questions about Haig's operational understanding about his continual desire for a breakthrough, which was probably ill-suited to the sort of middle period of the war. Um, but I think we just have to understand the nature of conflict in the First World War. It was a war of, an, of enormous industrial power of mass, and it was always going to be extraordinarily costly. Whether Haig could have done it slightly with slightly fewer casualties, I think, is an argument we might want to have. But he is in a position where it's very easy to fail in the First World War and fail very, very badly. And many commanders do. Haig, you know, the army continues to strengthen. The army continues to be, um, I think, broadly happy with its, its lot. It doesn't undergo the kind of crisis of morale that many of the other armies undergo, which I think is testament to Haig. Haig will always be controversial. He will always have that reputation as a man who, who was not caring. Um, but I think we have to see it within context and understand that these are battles of enormous complexity and enormous horror. Um, one of the French commanders on the Western Front said, whatever you do, you lose a lot of men. And what did he mean by that? Well, tactically, it's always going to be very difficult on the first, in the First World War battlefield because of the, the nature of firepower, the lack of manoeuvre. You're always going to struggle. You're always going to suffer heavy losses, even if you do everything right. So I think we always must understand that when we judge Haig.